we're okay now. Yeah. Okay, we should have start. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um Tofal Chiro Galer. Uh welcome everyone. Is uh Misha Angie Bertel. I'm Angie Bertel, and I'm gonna be co-chairing this evening's webinar with Nadine Finch, who's sitting here beside me. Um, Nadine is the chairperson of Labour for Irish Unity. I'd like to give a very special welcome to our guest speakers, Hishla Nick Le Liam, Liz Savile Roberts, Greg Query, and Tamar Sorian. Before I introduce our speakers, Nadine is going to say a few words about Labour for Irish Unity. And then after hearing all the speakers, we're going to take questions and comments. And we'd really appreciate it if, uh, if you think of any questions or comments as people are talking, if you wouldn't mind writing those into the chat, because it's a bit easier then, because Nadine will collate questions at the end and then she'll put them directly to the speakers. Um, so, would you like to? Yeah, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm chair of Labour for Irish Unity, uh, which is um, a British organisation organising in solidarity with what's happening in Ireland towards Irish unity, um, made up of members from the Labour movement, the wider Labour movement, trade unions, as well as the Labour Party, and also Irish community organisations. Um, we have been in existence about three years and we're slowly building support. Um, it's fair to say there's quite a lot of resistance to even talking or thinking about Ireland in Britain, which people will recognise from the past. Um, so one of our roles is to try and engender a discussion about both miscarriages and the history in Ireland in preparation for what hopefully will be a border poll because of course what the British will have to do whichever government's in power is to actually cooperate with calling a border, border poll. So we are looking to try and influence politicians, trade unionists, councillors to put their voice to um, Irish unity and we're also trying to work with trade councils. Um, we recognise we have an uphill struggle with the present Labour Party and it's fair to say we don't have many Labour MPs um, who support us. Um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn um, being an exception to that, um, and John McDonnell. Um, but we would welcome people joining. You don't have to be a Labour Party member to join. Um, you just have to show you're in the trade union or Irish organisation, if not the Labour Party. And we for once have a lot of members outside of London, which is good. We probably have our executive is more than 50% outside London. And we're planning to hold meetings in areas where there's an Irish community and try and build up from the bottom, not just being London centric. So please contact us if you want to know any more um, information about the organization. I'm going to hand over to Angie. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Uh... I mean, so this evening's webinar is uh, is very much a continuation of um, Labour for Irish Unity's education programme. And what we're focusing on tonight, really, is um, Irish language equality as a human right. And um, we want to examine the historical and political context within which the language developed. And we also want to consider the Irish language within the wider diaspora, not just within the island of Ireland. I mean, this issue is, is deeply as a deeply personal one for me too. Um, my brother, Tony Bertel, who died in October last year, uh, was a fluent um, Irish speaker and writer. And he taught Gaelic in the Liverpool Irish Centre for many years. Tibagornin uh, Gaelagaragom Och Tommy Egg Fowlum Gaelica Anish. Um, I only have a small bit of Irish, uh, but I am learning Irish now. And part of the reason I'm doing this is to keep the memory of my brother alive. So Cain for a will to hot Leshon Why is the Irish language important? 
Well, our first speaker, Kishla Nikliam, is well placed to start this discussion. Kishla is a language activist with the campaign group Amdram Darig, and she's an Irish, uh, she's a language rights coordinator with Conor Nagelager. Kishla obtained her master's degree from Queen's University Belfast in 2018, where her research focused on the development of Irish as a community language in West Belfast's Gaeltock Quarter. And Kishla is very involved in the ongoing fight for language rights for the Irish, Irish language community in the North. And it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening. That's a lovely introduction. Thank you very much. I'm just going to hopefully short, start sharing my screen there. Can you all see that okay? Just the, the PowerPoint? Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, I do spyro Goran Mila Mila Maya Gavasan Curry of A Live and Up. Thanks so much um, for the invitation to join us tonight. I am here on behalf of Andram Jarag, which is a, a campaign group that calls for a standalone uh, rights based Irish Language Act. And that is obviously something that was promised to our community in 2006 at the St Andrews Agreement. But I thought maybe before I start, it might be nice to give a bit of an insight into how I actually got involved in the campaign and why I became involved in the ongoing campaign um, for language rights. I suppose it's important to mention that Irish was my first spoken language at home. So myself and my brothers were raised through the medium of Irish and I attended an Irish medium primary school. Um, and I'll explain a bit later why it's a source of great pride that I went to the particular primary school that I did. Um, but then I went on to secondary school and didn't continue my education through the medium of Irish. I continued studying Irish, but I went to an English medium secondary school. And I suppose when I came to the end of my journey at school, I thought I'm not actually really finished. I feel like there's so much more that I could do here with the language. There's so many opportunities. And, and I suppose in a stubborn sort of way, the amount of people that asked me, you know, did I want to be a teacher when I told them that I wanted to go and study Irish at university? And anybody that knows me, I have all the respect in the world for teachers, but it's just not something that I ever really wanted to do. It's not a path I want to go down. I don't have the patience to be a teacher. So I suppose in a sort of a stubborn way, um, I wanted to show that there was a lot more that you could do. So I did my degree and then I again felt there was more I could do. So I studied a master's. And as you mentioned, there, I was focusing on the Giltocht area in West Belfast, which is an area which has been granted bespoke status by the Department for Communities um, and indeed for us in because of the high proportion of Irish speakers, organisations and, and schools that are in that area. And I was looking at things like what are the community doing to keep the, the Irish language alive on the ground? How is it so vibrant in this particular community? And I started seeing things like um, bilingual signs. And the impact that that was having on people actually feeling like they could use the language um, in this area. And I live about maybe seven minutes up the road from the Giltock Quarter. And again, the, the sort of stubbornness, I like to get my own way, the stubbornness in me sort of started going, well, why am I seven minutes up the road? And there's only English on my street signs, but in the Giltock Quarter, you know, they're bilingual. Why is that? And then I started looking at local council policy which actually dictates the erection of bilingual street signs. And I suppose that was for the first time that I saw that there was any sort of difference between myself as an Irish speaker and my right to see my language and to use my language in public. The process that I had to go through to, to ensure my language on signage was stacked against me effectively. And so that's sort of the first real experience that, that I had um, with discrimination with you know feeling any any way different but I suppose uh, from a campaign perspective um the Good Friday Agreement which was signed and ratified by the, the British and Irish governments promised uh, uh, was to herald a new era of equality in the north um historical grievances were to be addressed and marginalized sections of the community were to be quote unquote brought in from the cold and amongst the key issues that the good friday agreement dealt with was the issue of um, rights and respect for the irish language community and whilst it was relatively vague in nature um the attempt to include uh, the irish language in the wider equality agenda was symbolically important because it did actually ultimately lead to the British government committing to an Irish language act eight years later at St Andrews. Um, 
this obviously never materialized 16 years later the commitments she made have have yet to be delivered upon um and not only this but the irish language and its ever-increasing community have been subject to consistent vitriolic attacks and um, not from the margins but from mainstream political parties here so what we try and do in this presentation is to sort of chart the history and development of our campaign and the challenges that we have faced along the way what you'll often find that's missing in the campaign about an Irish Language Act is the fact that there's a very active, engaged and organised community of speakers who deserve to have their right to see and use their language enshrined in law. Um, an Irish Language Act isn't an attempt to you know, promote some, some overtly political agenda or nor is it an, an attempt to erode, to erode the identity of others. It comes from the understanding that um, language rights are indeed human rights and we have the right to have our rights enshrined in law um so i suppose and the good friday agreement made the first positive commitments to the language and to put that into perspective i was actually two years old when the good friday agreement was signed mm -hmm. and i am now 26 and still i await um the, the full implementation and of the commitments made to the irish language in the good friday agreement um, it did bring with it a genuine hope that we would be brought in from the cold um, and you know, ma major progress has certainly been made, particularly with regard to, you know, funding opportunities, the Irish medium education sector, the upward trajectory is a source of great pride, but consistent obstacles have been placed in our way in terms of visibility and rights and little progress has been made in that respect. Um, then we had the St Andrews Agreement in 2006, which did guarantee that Westminster would pass a language act, and this was to be based on the experiences of Wales and the south of Ireland. But in spite of these commitments, Irish speakers are still being discriminated against and without formal legal protections, we don't enjoy the same rights that other Gaelgory on this island enjoy, that Welsh speakers enjoy in, in Wales and that Scots Gaelic speakers enjoy in, in Scotland. And I suppose when we started out as a campaign, um, we had two real short term aims. The first was to have language rights viewed as human rights. And the second was to actually empower our community and to actively go on and claiming their rights. So when I was at my earliest stages, you know, of exposure to the campaign, I never really thought about the, the colonial mindset and the process of decolonization. You know, I just thought and I, and I just took it for granted, you know, the state are hostile to the language and that's the way it is. It didn't occur to me that this actually stems from a systemic history of hostility towards the language that laws and policies and practices were actually put in place to totally with the aim of totally eradicating the Irish language. And it's difficult, you know, to defeat that colonial mindset, even in today's society. I find it quite difficult when I'm trying to engage with public services, you know, through the medium of Irish. It's a very much, but why do you want it in Irish? Because you understand English rather than understanding my rights to receive services as a user of a minority language. So just some examples of some of the statements that have been made about Irish and obviously if you look at the date 1366 obviously the, the statutes of Kilkenny which were laws that were put in place to, to strengthen the British authority in Ireland Um, if any Englishman or Irishman dwelling among the English use Irish speech he shall be attained and his lands go to his lord till he undertake to adopt and use English Um, William Grant for example another MP the only people interested in this language are the avowed enemies of Northern Ireland so that just gives you a bit of an insight into that systemic hostility that has existed and does still continue to exist uh, towards the Irish language. Um, when we look at this campaign and the development, we look at it in three stages. Firstly, this concept of the language revival from below, the pioneering efforts of those generations that came before us and planted the seeds for the modern day Irish language revival. You have promises unfulfilled. Obviously, I mentioned the Good Friday Agreement, um, the European Charter, St Andrews Agreement, and most recently, the New Decade New Approach Agreement. And then you have this concept of the Gaelic Spring, which is a community-led campaign calling for rights, recognition and respect for the Irish language. And as I mentioned, outright hostility and legislative persecution were sort of the automatic reaction to the language and those who had the tenacity um, to speak Irish language promotion was totally alienated from the one party state here and it was practiced for this reason in the the hidden Ulster of the Ard Skull Altdach and Common Clunard which were two social clubs in Belfast that played a transformational role um, in the Irish language revival here 
Um, when I talked about my own primary school and why it's a source of great pride that I went there, if you consider the history of the school, it'll give you a bit of an insight. So essentially, there was a group of people who were attending the Common Cluenard in Belfast in, in 1969, 68 and 69. And, you know, they decided that they wanted better. They wanted to be able to use the language in public. It wasn't enough for them to be simply behind these closed doors. And once they went outside, they had to, you know, only speak English. So they did something so pioneering. They bought a plot of land on the outskirts of, of West Belfast in an area called the Shaw's Road. They built houses and they founded their own Gaeltacht area where they only spoke Irish to each other um, because they were so serious about this concept of a seal tree Gaelic, a life through Irish. And two years later, um, when their children began to become of, of school and age, you know, they had a decision to make. Did they send them to the nearest Irish media or English medium school in the area? Did they send them on a bus, you know, to, to other schools in Dublin, for example? Well, no, they were trying to create this concept of, of a seal tree Gaelic, a life through Irish. And they functioned very much on this manner of na habere, jane, don't say it, do it. So they founded their own school in 1971, Bunskofa first year. And that's actually the school that I attended. The school was founded in 1971, um, but it functioned for 14 years without any state recognition um, or funding. So essentially for the first 14 years of my school's life, um, parents were, when they could afford to, paying the teachers' salaries. The teachers were going out and having to buy their own resources. They were literally in, in huts. You know, the, the, the building was up in terrible, terrible condition. And there is no doubt that had it not been for them, that we would not be where we are today um, in terms of the success of the Irish language revival. Um, when we look at the, the building the campaign from below, I suppose our campaign very much came to the fore very organically. You know, every night thousands of people are going and, and are raising their children through Irish or are, you know, attending Irish language classes are doing the things in the background that make our campaign so transformational. And they are what Gramsci describes as your earthworks and your fortifications. They are the foundations of your campaign. Our campaign stems from, it sort of started to come together firstly in 2014 because there was a number of sub campaigns at the time that were coming to the fore. Um, there was a campaign at the time in um, North Belfast, for example, because the Department of Education were refusing to provide a bespoke transport service from children who were traveling from the north of the city to the west of the city to the only Irish medium secondary school in the north at that time because they cited that the um, statutory duty that they are under was only to be of aspirational value. There was a campaign at the time in Dungiven. Uh, for the establishment of a second Irish medium secondary school because of the high proportion of primary schools in Derry. If children in Derry wanted to receive at the time educate secondary school education through the medium of Irish, they had to travel to Belfast, which was a two-hour journey uh, there and a two-hour journey back. So we held our first camp, our, our first public rally in 2014 in La Jarrig, and that showed us really for the first time that ordinary people could make meaningful change because the year later, Gale College Jagara, the second Irish medium secondary school, was founded in Derry and the Department of Education reinstated the funding for the children to travel from North Belfast to West Belfast to College to First Year. And then, I suppose, in 2016, there was a period, a very a quiet period. You know, we had these immense successes, 2014-15. 2016 was quite, it was quite quiet. Um, and people started to reconvene over a lack of progress. The programme for government, for example, 2015-2021, um, totally omitted nearly the Irish language. The draft strategy, which had been um, conducted by the Department for Communities at the time, had just been voted, voted down by the executive. So still, even though we had made this progress, there were still consistent barriers being placed in our way of making any sort of progress with regards to rights and language visibility. So we started to come together. We were meeting, we were, you know, every week, just how can we, what can we do here? How can we make change? How are we going to challenge the systemic discrimination that our community continues to face? We came up with the concept of our logo, 
which is the red, the red background with the white circle. The red comes from the Irish saying Jarag Lafarag, which is red with rage. And the white circle in the middle comes from the Fania, which you obtain when you receive obtain a certain level of fluency in Irish. And we were saying, well, what are we calling for? How can we solve this problem? And we the only way to challenge the 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 discrimination that the state were sort of having towards us was to call for the establishment of the introduction of a rights-based standalone Irish language act and we had all this energy and we were built up you know early late 2016 but we just didn't have a means to disseminate our message and almost as if by magic the LIFA crisis happened so for anyone that's not and I'm going to try I know I'm conscious of time here so I do apologize I'm going to try and whiz through this last few slides and um, the LIFA bursary scandal for anyone who's not familiar with it on the 23rd of December 2016, the Communities Minister at the time, Paul Given, um, informed Giltock College boards that uh, the LIFA bursary scheme would no longer be going ahead and he wished them a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Now, the LIFA bursary scheme was a scheme that enabled children from the most disadvantaged areas to attend summer Giltock Colleges to go and to study the language um, for the period of, of one, two or three weeks. And this decision was actually taken without any consideration for the impact that that would have on the families who relied on that funding for their children to go to the Giltock. And it was conducted without an equality impact assessment. The LIFA bursary scandal was, you know, part of a series of vitriolic attacks that were that the DUP were conducting on the Irish language at the time. But if you like, it was the straw that broke the camel's back because it awoke people in a way that nothing else ever had. Um, and I suppose the way in which the LIFA bursary scandal was delivered was, you know, no, uh, no accident. Because if you think about it, it was the 23rd of December. There was a sort of expectation that we would forget about it. You know, Happy Christmas and Happy Christmas and Happy New Year was what the, the email was signed off with. So the very opposite happened. Um, we kept working over the, the Christmas holiday. We put our logo out on social media on the 6th of January 2017, shortly after Christmas. And within a week, 10,000 people had uh, changed their profile pictures and were actively standing in, in solidarity with us and with our campaign. And we planned our first public protest for the 12th of January um, under the umbrella of Andram Jarug outside the Department for Communities headquarters in, in Belfast, which you'll see here just on this slide. But miraculously, um, the morning of, you know, the, the protest, Minister Given found the money and reinstated the funding for the LEAFA scheme, £50,000 um, that he removed during the same period that he and his party had squandered millions um, on the renewable heat incentive, really just demonstrated the crass nature in which the state were dealing with the language. And so a lot of political commentators were coming to us on the morning of and saying, are you still going ahead with the protest? And we were saying, well, absolutely, we're still going ahead with the protest. You know, the damage is done. This is, the, the, the problem is at LIFA. The problem is the way that the state have continued to deal with the language. We need a permanent solution to ensure that things like LIFA don't happen again. Um, and I'm sort of trying to jump here because of, I'm conscious of time. Um, obviously, 2017 to 2020, there was no function executive here. And one of the main reasons for, for that was cited for that was the the, the question of the Irish Language Act and rights recognition and respect um, for the Irish language. I suppose January 2020 was symbolic because the new decade, new approach for the first time in a state which historically discriminated against and, and marginalised our community. Um, the Irish language was recognised and was to exist in law. We, we recognised at the time that, you know, this bill fall, fell far short of what we were promised in the 2006 St Andrews Agreement. But it was certainly a stepping stone that, that we could build upon and it was a significant milestone in our ongoing campaign. And each um, provision relating to the Irish language was actually to be implemented within 100 days. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. So it was delay after delay after delay. And I'm conscious of time here. I'm skipping right to the very end. Um, yes, so within 100 days, we were supposed to have the um the enactment of all provisions to the Irish language this didn't happen um a de initial deadline was set of 100 days then it was changed secretary of state Brandon Lewis at the time um gave a commitment that the British government would introduce it by October 2021 
this didn't happen. The goalposts were then changed again and we saw a move towards the end of the Stormont mandate in March 22. This didn't happen and then they, they said that they were committed to do it before the Stormont elections in May 2022. And then shortly before the elections, um, Brandon Lewis, the Secretary of State at the time, came out and said that it wouldn't be right or proper to introduce such contentious legislation during such a contentious election period despite the fact that this legislation had already been pre-written and pre-agreed in, in January 2020. So that's when we really started to organise for something big. You know, after two years of COVID, we needed to bring our community together and we started going into schools, meeting community groups and really gathering momentum for something big. And we started planning for an large arg, which took place on the 25th of May 2022. Um, where we had 20,000 people taken to the streets and calling for Bart Durer Breher or Honour Your Word, obviously aimed at the British government who committed to introduce this legislation by October 2021. And we were now in May 2022. So the significance of the day shouldn't really be lost upon anybody because four days later, after um, and La Jarig, the British government introduced the Identity and Language Bill at Westminster and hot off the press um when i made this obviously this royal ascent there's a timer beside it because it hadn't happened yet but i'm delighted to be able to say that um the identity and language bill has actually received royal assent this afternoon and the bill is now officially an act of of parliament so um that's where we are now obviously the implementation of the bill is another question and um, there are now concurrent powers for the secretary of state to step in in the absence of an executive but for such a long-standing campaign, um, we are delighted at this another historic milestone in, in our campaign and we will continue to identify the gaps and, and challenge any shortcomings just as we have done up until now. That was very, very interesting. Thank you. Would you mind returning the host to Nadine? Of course. Of course. <laughs> that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you and, and well done. Um, I'm sure people might like to put questions and comments in the chat. Please do. I'm going to move straight on and give a warm welcome to our next speaker, um, Liz Savile roberts uh, Liz is Clyde Comrie's first female MP. She has represented the Dwivo Merinid constituency in Wales since 2015, increasing her majorities in the 2017 and 19 elections. Originally from London, uh, Liz learned Welsh while at university in Aberystwyth. A former journalist and lecturer, she's been a staunch supporter of Irish language rights. She's one of the few MPs ever to have spoken Irish in the House of Commons. And she played a key role in ensuring that the Irish Language Act finally <laughs> got through both Houses of Parliament this year, giving the language official status. I hope that's not the bell calling for you to go and vote, it Liz. Is, it is, yeah. Is it? Yeah, it is. No. Oh, are you able to speak then? Oh, fa fantastic. Could you could you unmute yourself, Liz? It's the adjournment bell. All is well. Oh, great. <laughs> oh, thank God for that. <laughs> oh, great. Welcome. Okay. Oh, good morning, Angie. Well, ta ach skele gyrnish fwy yra. Sianulacht an anwa. Anwa. And um, anish... Uh, uh, tar an ober er tossa. <laughs> okay, right. Um, well, thank you very much um, for the time I've got. What I thought I would do was just go on a bit of a um, a, 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 a a very brief history of so something that the Kushler has just done in relation to Irish and, and West Belfast. Some of the the key events for Welsh language protest over the last. We're almost talking about a century, not quite now, but some of the key, and I think you may well find that there's, there's, there's some common ground here, which is quite interesting. And I'll talk a little bit about the legislation, I'll talk a little bit about my experience. 
I'm really interested to see there's somebody from Awen Mirion here, which is the bookshop in Bala. So I have to be quite careful because I thought I'd get away with saying anything and I could get it wrong and no one would notice, but now they will. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, so which, which, which is great because actually we have, uh, that's the, the historic, the recent historical connection between the constituency of Duivo Merionet, which is basically South Gwynedd. It's the, the lower half of Snowdonia, the thin peninsula, uh, and down to Abadavi. It also includes Brongorch, um, which of course was where the internment camp was in uh, in 1916. And th there is a collection, there's a, there's a gentleman who lives in the village there now who's collected as many of the, of, of the memorabilia that still exists. And there is an event at least once a year to celebrate that. So there's that direct connection, of course, between the, the Van Gogh camp and the um, Easter six, you know, the 1916 Easter Rising. But just to look at, um, the Wales experience, and um, and I'm I'm proud to do this because I often think that we don't, between the experiences of Wales and Ireland, we we don't know enough of our common experience and, and what we've achieved in terms in terms of language. And I think we we should learn from each other because there's been some real successes in different ways. I mean, Kushla, I visited Ancultralan, I think it was four years ago now, and what really impressed me from when I the Irish that I learned was from the, the, the very rural Geltacht of Connemara, Kosharaka, um, and Kararua. And uh, to me, Irish, I did a bit of degree as well with Welsh, it's very associated with being a rural, uh, a rural experience. So for me to have that really urban experience and that really urban enthusiasm was absolutely fantastic in, in, in West Belfast. Um, right, just to do a bit of a, 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 a rattle, gallop through. I was just thinking it was one of our first big national consciousness of, uh, events in Wales was, was something called Pena Berth, near Pulheli, which is in the Clean Peninsula, in 1936, when the RAF wanted to establish a bombing school on a farm, actually really quite an old, an ancient major farm as a building. Um, but the RAF had attempted to establish bombing schools elsewhere as well, and they'd always been turned down. And three of the founders of Plaid Cymru, um, Saunders Lewis, Lewis Valentine, and uh, DJ Williams, alongside some other people, there was a pro there was a real protest against this being done because the Llyn Peninsula then, as now, seemed to be a, a heartland of Welsh language culture. And that this would be placed right bang in the middle and have a a a, 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 a bad influence. It would, it would it would reduce that cultural influence. And although there was a series of protests, they were all overridden. So this bombing school started to be built. And then the three men I just named, along with some other helpers, went in at, at night and set fire to the buildings that were there. And then they gave themselves up to the police straight away. And it was a very um, it was a very famous case at the time. Jury in Carnarvon couldn't reach a verdict on it, and it went to the Old Bailey in the end. And as I said, these are regarded as, as the founding fathers of, of Plaid Cymru. Um, a very similar and much more modern, because in the sense that it's in people's lifetimes now, and again, very much related to that Van Gogh area I just talked about is if you travel around Wales, you will see big red signs painted on walls red background with white writing called saying Coviwch Trewerin, Coviwch Trewerin, which means remember Trewerin. Yeah, now, this was the... He's uh, on, a, yeah, I'm just listening to this. Just now? Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and again with Trewerin, uh, and this, this very much resonates now again, that Trewerin as a, as, a, as a small community, the, the river is called Trewerin and Capel Kellin, the, the chapel of Kellin was actually the name of the village, was selected by the Liverpool Corporation to be a source of water. And actually the argument at the time that was used that, that was that Liverpool needed this because their water was insufficient and that there were you know, cases of cholera, which I must admit that if somebody presented me with those arguments now, I'd be very sympathetic with them. The upshot actually was that the water was used and sold for industrial purposes. It didn't make a difference to residential, to the quality of residential water. 
And although the villages protested, in fact, they went to Liverpool in 1956, led by Gwynbor Evans, who was the leader of Plaid Cymru for a very long period of time, highly influential, our first MP in 1966. They went to Liverpool. Um, it was actually presented, it, it, it was a, I had to have a, 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 an act in Parliament to be passed for this reservoir to be formed. No Welsh MP supported it. One abstained, the rest all voted against it. And again, it was one of those critical moments when you suddenly realise that it doesn't matter how many Welsh MPs you have, even if they have unity of opinion, they will get voted down. And again, this is one of the things that we we, we continue to quote as, as, as from, from the, you know, the, the the, the national cause for Wales as to how, how we will be treated by Westminster. So that was very influential. Um, that was very much a, a, a time of protest as well. And then we're leading, we're getting into the, the early 60s by now. And quite um, strikingly compared to the, the Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Act, which has just become, again, been enacted and made protest uh, effectively illegal if the police or other powers that be decide so. Um, actually, many of the protests that brought about the change for the status of Welsh, which in all administrative terms had been wiped off the books since the Acts of Union in, 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 the, in the mid 50s, in 1555, um, we would not have any Welsh legislation in place at all. So actually, the, one of the first major pieces of specifically Welsh language protest was on a bridge called Pont Trevechan in Aberystwyth. And it's that we've been using that as a comparator with this uh, legislation against protests because they blocked a bridge and they wouldn't be able to do that now. And yet that is one of the iconic pieces, pieces of protest um, that again, you know, over and over again, as Krishna, you, you said, unless you protest, it doesn't happen otherwise. So again, so you've got Pont and that was in 1963. And of course, we had the investiture in, in the 60s as well, um, which we have another one of those on the line. And that, again, was very much a time of, of unrest. Um, now, I don't know if any of you have noticed, um, if you've been following the World Cup, and we, I mean, we're very, very proud that Wales got to the World Cup. We'd have loved to have gone further, but we, should, <laughs> we were there. And it, it is that sense of being on the world stage. Absolutely brilliant. But you may have noticed a, a, a gentleman, a folk singer, singing a song called A Mohit, with which you know, he set off the Welsh team, first of all. Now, A Mohit uh, was sung, was being sung in the, in the Welsh football games um, by a gentleman called David Ewan. Now, David Ewan was a, a very influential protester for, in the 1960s. And he went to prison um, for, I mean, there's wonderful pictures of him. If you, if you Google him, you'll see pictures of him outside the police station, which is back to back with the magistrate courts, the old one in Aberystwyth, right on the front, leaping out of this door onto a pile of, of road signs, monolingual English road signs, which they'd torn down and, you know, and, and, and the spray paint over the Welsh versions of these names. And again, he went, went to prison for that. So, I mean, to think we've, we've got this language protester leading many non-Welsh speakers in this song in Welsh soccer. It really, it's, it's been one of the pivotal experiences of this year. It's, it's so good. Um, I mentioned Gwynver Evans earlier on with the Trewerin. Again, he was uh, his great mark, as well as being the first Plaid Cymru MP from a by-election in 1966. Mm -hmm. He was um, also, it, fundamentally instrumental in Wales having a Welsh language television channel with S4C, Espadorec. Um, and he threatened to go on hunger strike in 1980 because the Tories didn't keep, they were doing, a, they did a U-turn on their manifesto promise to bring a Welsh language, to, to, to finance a Welsh language television channel for Wales. And, um, he, Margaret Thatcher believed him. People, he, he didn't go on hunger strike, but he threatened it, and it was sufficiently credible um, that that he um, you know, that, that he that that was the, one of the turning points in getting Espedorek as foreseen. I mean, interestingly, actually, Gwynvor, when he was first elected as in the by-election, he tried to take his oath 
as an MP through the medium of Welsh, and he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it then. That didn't actually come in until 1974 when we got in our, our next two MPs. And the last um, person I'd like to mention in terms of the really influential protesters is uh, a woman called Anghara Thomas, who's well known as a, a, a novelist and also she writes children's books, uh, Rana Rudins, who's a lovely little little witch with, with, with her cat. In fact, I'm with you and a song about Rana Rudins and the cat. And um, she again, she has spent six period of times in prison in language protests. She's also a protester for, in, in, for, for, for peace and against colonialism. So we've got these really big figures from the 60s and the 70s who put in place the, the ground rule for, for, for protesting over the language. And then in 1993, we got the Welsh Language Act, which set up um, the Welsh Language Board and gave the, the, the private individual the right to interact in Welsh with public authorities. And that actually, and it set up Welsh language schemes, which is how public authorities, public bodies were obliged to show how they would enable that right for the private individual. Um, it wasn't a perfect piece of legislation, but it was actually pretty much groundbreaking. And then of course, in 1999, we got our own uh, assembly as it was then, that developed into proper lawmaking power body as the Senate as it is now. And in, let me get my dates right, I think it was 2011, the, um, yes, good, yes it was, the Welsh Language uh, Act, or the Welsh Language Measure, Welsh Language Wales Measure, brought in language standards, which actually speci specified that Welsh should not be treated less favourably than English. It disposed of the role of the Welsh Language Board and brought in the role of the Welsh Language Commissioner. So we've we've had legislation. In fact, there actually were, there was an earlier piece of legislation about the right to use Welsh within the court system as well. But so we've got these certainly two big pieces of legislation. Um, the one thing that I really would say from my experience, again, more with with the west coast of Ireland, but and, and to a lesser degree with the, with the sort of energy that I sense, just the sort of attitudes as well in, in West Belfast. Um, there, that, there, is a, there is a world of difference between legislation and use. We need legislation to underpin, but just as assuming that we teach a language as a medium, an education medium in a school, it means that we, we equip people with rights, we equip people with skills. Those two things are essential, but they don't in and of themselves make speakers. So one of the things that we have to be always doing actually is encouraging the use, creating the environments in which you use language and creating the supportiveness around using language. I mean, one of the things um, that it's very important to me is that people are not hyper correct uh, to a degree with, with both Welsh and with Irish, English is a terrible curse to us because it is so universal and it is so well resourced. But it's also very useful because if you are actually stuck, you can always use an English word. And it is far Gaelic a brishta na no no berachlista um camraid blair and Welsh as a the same sort of of idea. So we do have to we have to give people the opportunity to use it, and we have to reward the using of it. If you think of it, I mean, I've looked at this from the point of view of some second language school children. There's a real risk that some of their experiences are constantly being constantly being corrected, constantly being not quite good enough in the target language. So we've got to get past that. We've got to make it fun. Yep, and they may not be writing their essays in it, but let's hope they're playing football, they're singing, or they're doing a drama, that they're doing something that they associate with fun with it. Um, so, I mean, that really, I think if I could leave it at there, I would welcome any any questions after. But today really is, it is a day of celebration. I mean, it's been such a long haul to get the, the Irish Language Act through. Um, you know, I've sat there with the DUP breathing down my neck when I said, um, it's, 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 it's
it, and, and that's the worst that I've had. I know there's been a lot worse than that for other people. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity for sharing our experiences, dear Helen. Jeremiah, good. Um, thank you, Liz. Uh, go ahead and talk. Um, that was great. I'm sure, again, uh, very inspiring, very comprehensive, and, and lots of ideas there. So please uh, make a note of anything you want to raise later. Um, we've heard about the revival of Irish in the context of the decolonization of Ireland, uh, but we want to now look at the importance of the Irish language within the wider Irish diaspora. And our next speaker, Greg Query, is going to help us with this. Originally from County Down, um, Greg took part in the early civil rights demonstrations and was later a community worker in Belfast. Uh, since the 1970s, he's lived and worked in Liverpool, and his book, In Hardship and Hope, provides us with a history of Liverpool's Irish community. Um, Greg was chair of the Great Hunger Committee, which erected Liverpool's memorial in 1998, and he also published my late brother Tony's book, um, the Irish Lang A Hidden History of the Irish Language in Liverpool. So over to you, Greg. If you could unmute yourself, please. Right. Gora Maragot, uh, Angie, uh, Geoditch, uh, Greg Querley, uh, is uh, Anam Dom, Atom e e Mahoney, e Larfall, August Vime e Mahoney, Ansha, uh, Blaina, Fada, Tom Agfolu, Gilga, Anish, August Shillam, is far Gaelic Brista, na Barla Klista, as uh, Liz has just said. Um, one of the questions Angie put to me was why learn Irish, and I'll just uh, give a few thoughts on, on that. Um, if you are Irish, it's the language of your own country, which has only very recently fallen out of uh, public use. So recent is the decline in Irish that most people of my age group, I'm over 70, um, have got close relatives who uh, were raised as Irish speakers. Although I was brought up in Protestant North County Down, my grandfather on my mother's side was an Irish speaker. And although my wife was brought up in Kirkdale in Liverpool, her mother was an Irish speaker. So the decline of, langu of the language is uh, relatively recent. Um, it's a challenging language, but a very beautiful one to speak and amongst the oldest languages uh, in Europe. And it served as a voice of the Irish people up until uh, the late 19th century. And it's the repository of our folklore and our history and a great body of literature and poetry. And if you do not understand the language, you are locked out from all of that culture. And most important of all, from my point of view, is uh, it's uh, it gives you an understanding of the values, the outlook and the mindset of uh, the people who spoke Irish for all those hundreds of not thousands of years. It's about 30 years now since Angie's brother, Tony, first suggested that we organise the commemoration of the Irish Great Hunger here in Liverpool and the 100th and 50th anniversary. We formed a committee and we soon found that we'd struck a chord with people uh, in Merseyside and I should say at this point that um, not only was there a huge influx of Irish people into Merseyside, but um, Liverpool was basically built by the Welsh, if you're talking about housing. Um, we had a huge number of Welsh people living in the city, and there was actually a very strong Welsh quarter, um, which is now marked uh, with a plaque by the Welsh community. Um, and also... Um, uh, Liverpool was the first place where I heard Celtic languages spoke in public when I was on the terraces uh, at Goodison Park and uh, people talking away freely who had uh, come up from Wales to watch the game and uh, talking uh, in Welsh uh, at um, the football matches in Liverpool in the uh, 70s. Um, so we found that we got wave after wave of support uh, from the local community for the uh, raising fundraising for the uh, a memorial uh, in Liverpool, which would be substantial and uh, appropriate and uh, have lasting impact uh, on the city and the region. And we were uh, 
successful in doing that. And we also erected uh, a number of plaques around the city at places associated with that time and with the Irish community's experience uh, at that time. And those uh, plaques were both in English and Asgeilga. Uh, and we are proud of the fact that um, there is more Irish language on display in Liverpool than in any other uh, British city. And in all the years since we put those plaques in place, not one of them has been damaged or vandalised in any way. Um, but uh, those our primary objective was really was to get the memorial and the plaques in place. And we felt at the time that it was a job well done and our goals had been achieved. It's only been in the years since that um, we began to realise that our work, important though it was, was only one step along the road and there would be, would be many other steps to follow. Um, the work of examining the famine, of talking about it, uh, of uh, learning more about uh, what it did to um, the country and to the diaspora and how it has impacted on following generations is something which has been unfolding and it's given me a sense of uh, how long uh, these things take to unfold and unravel, that the process of decolonization is just not a matter of uh, having uh, a rebellion and establishing uh, an independent parliament. There's a lot more uh, to it than that. Um, a good example of that unfolding story uh, is Tony Bertel's research on the Irish language in Liverpool, Tony, who's uh, Angie's brother. Um, it was a topic about which we uh, knew little at the time, uh, and indeed the accepted view in uh, Liverpool historiography, in, in the written history of Liverpool, was that the Irish language uh, was not uh, much spoken uh, in the city. And Tony researched the topic with great thoroughness and tenacity and determination. And after some years, uh, was in a position uh, to challenge that accepted view of uh, local historians uh, and to prove that, in fact, there was an extremely significant Irish language presence in the city. Uh, he relied on many sources, uh, which had been around for years, but never been brought together in one place and in such an articulate and readable fashion. One example he dug up was that um, in the 1830s, uh, 24,000 people put their names to a petition uh, to the propaganda for the faith in Rome, asking the papal authorities to provide Irish language clergy in Liverpool because people could not practice their Catholic faith, especially uh, confession and the last rites, uh, because they didn't have priests who could speak Irish. So that was one of the in indicators Tony turned up. Uh, of um, the huge number of Irish speakers that there were in Liverpool and the influence that they consequently had upon the city. Um, he also um, gave a, a very uh, detailed account of um, how subsequent generations of uh, Liverpool Irish speakers made a substantial contribution to the revival of the language in the early 20th century and indeed uh, to the Easter Rise and a War of Independence, especially Norma Both, Mc, Pierce Beasley, and Seska Trench. Um, when I read Tony's manuscript, uh, I, I knew that it had to be published, and uh, I was very proud to be involved in bringing that about. Uh, and we, we uh, published uh, 400 copies initially, and in a few, in a short space of time, they've all gone and we're now going to a reprint. So this book on the history of the Irish language in Liverpool has proved very popular in the city and in Ireland. So there's a, a great bedrock uh, of interest there. Um, and in, in those years when Tony was writing the book, he, he was uh, the person who I think was the, the, the main mover in putting up that uh, commemorative stone at Frong Gok. And uh, we were also uh, found that there was great support in Liverpool for um, any campaign uh, around the Irish language, in particular, 
the Glorna Nail campaign, when funding was withdrawn from childcare provision in West Belfast because government thought that uh, there were um, active Republicans on the uh, committee. And uh, we invited people over to Liverpool at that time uh, who were uh, campaigning for that education facility, which was teaching children through the medium uh, of Irish. Um, and uh, the uh, Liz mentioned the word decolonization, and I think that is a key thing. Um, the uh, the key predominant theme of Ireland's past uh, is colonialism, though to read many of the histories, you wouldn't think that that was the case. Uh, and since the famine, we've spent a great deal of energy um, in um, fighting uh, for Irish land, and then establishing a parliament in Dublin and establishing uh, economic independence. Um, and there's been a great revival in Irish culture, and I myself spent a lot of time learning to play Irish music. But uh, all this has been achieved, but the restoration, or at least the partial restoration of the Irish language, is the biggest single item, I think, on the agenda for uh, Irish people, not just in Ireland, uh, but uh, the Irish diaspora uh, around the world. Um, I will uh, put a reference to those uh, the, the, the Tony's book that I've mentioned, and also to my own book on the history of the Irish in Liverpool in the chat. If anybody wants to get in touch with me, I can uh, get copies of those for them. And they'll be around to answer uh, any questions later on. For am I good, Greg? Uh, that was very, that was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to move straight on now to our final speaker, uh, Thomas O'Rean, Tomas O'Rean. Um, Tomas is the chairperson of the Liverpool branch of Conran and Gallagher, and he's a very active member of Liverpool Irish Centre. He's originally from County Tipperary, um, Tomás has lived in Liverpool since 1970. He was formerly a merchant Navy ships officer and was also qualified in electrical engineering and occupational safety and health. Like Greg, Tomás was a good friend of my brother Tony and he's relearning the Irish language and he's very kindly also sacrificed a bridge match uh, to be with us here tonight. So um, well done for doing that. <laughs> Over to you, Tomás. Uh, you need to unmute yourself. Tomas. Hi, you just need to um, yeah, nice one. Yeah. Yeah. Or Maha good that's the Kara con kind and you. Uh be the Eve Galera Karda. It's Misha Tomas or Rean. I was just call here lock Conan Gelga Larful May. And oops. Bavalum couple of fuckle a raw. We start na a grief to Conan O'Gallia. We are grave, I tool and shaw, a larful, I was concrete, concrete now, you're going in form fame. Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Ryan, and I am chair of the Liverpool branch of Conan O'Gallagher. The previous speakers have given us an excellent account of the great work done by Andran Dram Darug, the support for the Irish Language Act given by Clyde Kimru, and the history of the Irish language here in Liverpool. It remains for me to say a few words about the history of the Conrad O'Gallagher organisation, our local branch here in Liverpool, and finally, a little about myself. In the aftermath of the famine on Gotham Moor, the number of native Irish speakers plummeted, but by the late 1800s, Traditional Irish language and culture had almost disappeared in Ireland, surviving mainly in a few isolated areas 
along the western seaboard of the island. A group of Irish academics recognized this and founded the Gaelic League, later to become known as Conran na Gaelga. It was founded as a non-political organization with the sole aim of preserving and promoting Irish identity, language, and culture, which at this time was stigmatized as the culture of the poor and the uneducated. The organization was founded in 1893, and Douglas Hyde, one of its founding members, became its first president. Padraig Pearce, the leader of the 1916 uprising, also recognized the importance of the Irish language. And his catchphrase, Tear Gone Tonga, Tear Gone Onam, translated as a country without a language is a country without a soul, uh, resonates with our efforts to preserve and promote the language today. One of the aims stated in the present Conan O'Gaelia Constitution is to promote the use of the Irish language as the standard language of Ireland. There are now 200 branches of the Conan O'Gaelia organization scattered all over the world. Liverpool had no less than seven different branches of Conan O'Gaelia in the early 1900s. Our present branch, the Dr. John E. Gunnavoin branch, was founded on the 1st of May, 1896, and was the oldest and largest of the Liverpool branches. Alas, our branch is the only branch that still survives, the others having long since fallen by the wayside. In 1990, Dr. Brian Stoll, the Manx-born Irish teacher in Liverpool by that time retired, and Tony Bushell took over the role from him, teaching Irish every week at the Irish Centre. At the same time, he revived our local Conrad de Guelga branch, which had been in the, in the doldrums at that time. Tony remained as mainstay of the branch all down the years thereafter and was branch secretary from 1990 right up into his death in October 2021. May the Lord have mercy on his soul. Tony's untimely death came as a great shock to us all, and we were ill prepared to deal with his aftermath. Building on the bedrock of his solid foundations, we set about trying to pick up the pieces. Our first task was to form a new committee. Then we drew up a new constitution and prepared various policies to enable us to be eligible to apply to various organizations for grants. And luckily, we were successful in some of these applications. The funding obtained was invaluable as it enabled us, amongst other things, to buy more course books, pay for teachers, and to run intensive Irish language courses from time to time, and to establish with others Tony Bushell Scholarship, which paid for a week's course in Irish at the Idhersquail College in County Donegal for a qualifying student every year. COVID resulted in a reset in most people's lifestyles. And we at Conor Nagalia Liverpool were no different. During lockdown, we learned to conduct our, our activities online. And we successfully developed online Irish language classes. As restriction these, we returned to face-to-face -face lessons, but retained the online lessons as there, were, there was a continued demand for them. At present, we offer a total of six language classes weekly at different levels of ability. Some online, others face to face. These courses are free of charge 
and are open to anybody who has an interest in learning the Irish language. There is also a weekly online book club where a book written in Irish is translated into English by the group. And we are starting a monthly online session to provide the opportunity to converse socially in Irish. We hold other events such as pop up Gale talks and then Lone Gale, Lone Gale, yeah, on a regular basis. Where again we have the opportunity to practice our Irish language conversation skills in a social session. Again, participation is open to everybody, although a level of proficiency in Irish is required to successfully participate in these social events. Currently, we have around 70 students and are running more or less at our full capacity with the teacher resources that we have available. Indeed, some courses were oversubscribed and we had to turn away some students this year. From time to time, we run joint events with the Manchester Irish Language Group when our interests overlap and we are forming links with other Irish language groups na nationally. I've noticed a significant increase in the interest in the Irish language here in Liverpool over recent years. It is not entirely clear to me why this is, but I suspected the controversy surrounding the introduction of the Identity and Language Northern Ireland Bill 2022 and the high profile campaigns run by Andram Darg, Conor Gaelge, and others have much to do with it. The passage of this new act into law today finally repeals the Administration of Justice Language Act Ireland 1737, which banned the use of Irish in courts of law, thus depriving those native Irish who would only speak Irish access to justice. Passage of the new act into law represents a major milestone for the status of the Irish language, and not before this time, after nearly 400 years of suppression. In support of the new act, Conorigalia locally have lobbied our MPs and the Irish government, and we've also supported on Drum Darug in their efforts to have the new legislation enacted. And finally, Tom Ryan. Irish language and culture has always had a special significance for me. I was born and reared in rural County Tipperary in the 1940s. From the time I was a toddler, I grew up listening to Irish music and watching Cayley dances. More often than not, the casual set danced around our kitchen floor the music provided by a few locals playing melodians, fiddles, tin whistles, often with somebody accompanying, accompanying them with spoons or a washing board and a comb. Invariably, somebody would sing or recite at some juncture, frequently about folk heroes of the past who would perform valiant deeds for Ireland's cause. The immersion in this culture imbued a graph of Irish music and culture in me, which has remained to this day. By the time I left secondary school, I had a good grasp of the Irish language. However, users are losers. Mm -hmm. And after leaving Ireland as a young man, I seldom used it again until I retired. And by that time, I found I had forgotten most of it. However, after a retirement, I joined Tony Bottle's glasses, and I am still studying the language and making steady progress towards becoming fluent again. Those of you that know me will know that any talk that I give would not be complete without an excerpt, an excerpt from a poem included somewhere in it. Yeah. Tonight is no different. So I want to finish by reciting the last verse of a poem that children of my age growing up in Ireland 
learned by heart on a school. Poem was written by the renowned Fenian poet Thomas Arn, Thomas Arn Davis. Davis was born in Mallow County, Cork, in 1814, and died at the young age of 30. He was a lawyer, political writer, and poet, and his credit with creating the culture of the modern Irish nationalism that we know today. He was also the chief organizer of the failed Young Ireland Rebellion of 1848. The title of the poem is A Nation Once Again, which is not finale for the subject of tonight's talk. A Nation Once Again, the last verse. So as I grew from boy to man, I bent to me that bidding. My spirit of his selfish plan and cruel passion ridding. For thus I hope some day to wait, or can such a hope be vain, when my dear country shall be made a nation once again. She no will acquire the for a Mahagut Adesh Doklum. Yeah. Thank you to all the speakers and I'm going to hand over to Nadine now. Are you going to, yeah, if, if people, we haven't had any questions in, in the chat. We've had some comments, but would anybody like to ask any of the speakers a question? Please either raise your hands more usefully raise it um, in the application at the bottom, but otherwise raise your hand if you can't use that. Um, for any of the speakers, it'd be good to actually have some feedback for them. So Pat Corrigan, I can see you. If you want to unmute yourself. Yes, thanks. Um, I wonder if any of our speakers could talk about the engagement of um, Protestants in Northern Ireland with Irish language. It's been mentioned, or it's been referred to, but you know, perhaps a bit more detail would be um, useful and interesting. Yeah. Certainly, I don't mind coming in on that first. Um, more so with my Conrina Gilliga hat on and my Jam Jarrah hat, speaking from a sort of professional capacity here. Um, I was actually fortunate enough during my earlier employment with Conrina Gilliga. I work as a language rights coordinator now, but Prior to that, I worked as a project coordinator where I was tasked with um, designing and delivering the R Shared Language Project, the Arjenga Horincha project. Um, and essentially that involved myself going into um, state schools, predominantly in um, community organizations who maybe have never had the opportunity to have that exposure to the language. Um, and I was delivering a workshop with them on, you know, their connection to Irish through their spoken English, through place names, through surnames. And what you found is it was brilliant. We had a, a pre-session questioner, you know, how much do you know about Irish? Almost all of the participants had no knowledge, no understanding or no exposure. And at the end, you were finding that they automatically wanted to find out more. And I think in a way um, that shows that there is a gap, there is an appetite there. We've been fortunate enough more recently and um, we run the People in Place project, which is uh, concerning around our shared heritage concerning place names. We have a place names coordinator who works with us in, in Dublin and again, going into the schools who may previously have not have had the opportunity um, to engage with the language and teaching them that it actually is all around us. And um, I think early exposure in particular is particularly important because, you know, the earlier the intervention, the, the more experience visibility you know language visibility sort of breeds um tolerance and, and understanding and the the work has been so rewarding and um, the feedback that we have received has been immense um and it's proven transformational because one of the sort of nicer stories that we have is uh, our project coordinator had gone into a school no they had no real experience with the language and when they when she left they were actually thinking about naming um their local forest 
as per the, the place name that she had told them of, of their area. I think it might have been Temple Moor or something, and they were going to name it, you know, and Chample Moor, Cran and Chample Moor. So it was lovely. Um, and it just it just does go to show you that often, you know, any you know, preconception or you know hostility it may be and more often than not it's just it's just down to a, a lack of knowledge and, and understanding that Irish is for everybody it doesn't belong to anyone and it really is um all around us thank you thank you um Greg do you want to uh, yes I was just going to say uh, I'm sure uh, Kristen knows a lot more about this than I do that um we had a speaker over the Liverpool Arts Festival recently Linda Irving who has got a lot of Irish speakers, hundreds of Irish speakers in Protestant East Belfast, uh, which in, in its character is not at all the same politics as West Belfast. Um, but she has very strongly made the point Kushla finished on, which is the Irish language is for everybody. She's saying the Protestant people is our language and they are chiming into that. So if you Google Linda Irving, you'd find out a lot about um, the, what she's doing in that part of Belfast. And there is a lot of uh, interest uh, in the Irish language uh, in that West Belfast community. Oh, sorry, that East Belfast community. Is there any other speaker who wants to reply? Or are there any other questions for other of the um, speakers? Or comments? Or comments? I mean, I found it very interesting what Liz said about the similarities between the um, protesters and the campaigners for the Welsh language, because quite often we think that the Welsh language has been embedded there far longer than it has. And so I found that quite interesting. Mm. Um, uh, the man, the iPad man, whose name I can't remember, <laughs> he's got his hand up. You need to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry about that. It's uh, Patrick is the name. Um, a very simple question, and I suppose I probably should know this, but I don't. Uh, what is or was Leofa? Okay. I don't want to comment on that. <laughs> um, so essentially, the the Leafa um, bursary Leafa comes from the, it means fluent in Irish. Um, so. The Leafa Bursary Scheme was set up by the DECAL Department of Community Arts and Leisure at the time, um, I think in 2015. Um, and it was essentially just a bursary scheme that enabled people from disadvantaged areas to go to the Giltacht for the summer and to spend either one, two or three weeks being immersed totally um, in the language. So that the scheme is actually still open um, now under the auspices of the Department for Communities rather than DECAL. Um, but it just enables, gives people the opportunity who may not have had it up until now to go to the Gale Talk. And it's not solely constrained to young people. You know, adult learners as well are more than welcome to, to apply for the Leaf Anniversary Scheme. Thank you. Are, are there any people who want to make comments? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Anybody else? No one else got their hand up at the moment, I can see. Is it, I think Rowan. Rowan. Yeah, and, and then Owen, yeah. Jerome, then Owen, yeah. Jerome, do you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. yeah um, I was um, <laughs> wanting um, yeah. to ask Kishra um, about um, if she had any specific idea for, um, at this point in time, um, uh, campaigners um, in the North, uh meeting or combining somehow with um uh Corinne Gedeger or any other interested people in England um in for example the north of England um uh in some way I I haven't any specific idea in mind at the moment but just a general feeling that it would be great to uh, having had this event to to follow it with some meeting up um, about how to develop things over here, here in, in England, and especially between uh, Conrad and Gaelica groups. Absolutely, no, totally open to that, um, Jerome. And I will leave you my email and 
it'll be a total open door of communication. We're more than happy. As I say, I'm one of many, many people who are involved in the in the campaign. Um, but certainly we would be more than happy to facilitate something. Thank you. And Owen, did you have did you want to say something? Yeah. That's myself, uh, Angie. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> well, first of all, uh, that was very, very enjoyable. Uh, all right. Um, that was a very, very enjoyable meeting. I, 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 a wee bit of experience in, in my own background working with uh, groups in England through Glow and Neil, uh, the Liverpool group and the Manchester Irish Language group, group over the years. At one stage, we had funding for a, a, a competition called Global Gilga through um, Glow and Neil, which was great, you know, because it, it meant that we were were up to tape of what, what was going on. Uh, I got the invitation to come here tonight and I wasn't 100% sure uh, in, in what direction it was coming. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, I, and I, I wrote back to Angie and to uh, somebody else. I can't remember the other name. And what I was really looking to do was a, a very personal thing. To make a plug here that I'm available to come and talk to um, Irish language groups in, in, in England or Scotland or, or, or Wales very interesting that there was so much talk here tonight about Frongok, because uh, I, I have this book, which is called Pledge, uh, and it's um, it won a prize at the Eric this last year, and it's uh, a book talking about the Hitch Block protest between 1976 and 1981. And uh, the, the book, it's about the protest, obviously, about life in the wings, but a, a good part of the book as well talks about how prisoners acquired the, the Irish language. And then from that, you know, a lot of ex-prisoners in, in turn went out there and, and became a, a language activists in, in uh, the North and in the South. They live in Galway, so it's not just, a, it's, it's not confined to the North. I'm from Derry originally. So look, the, the plug is there. If anybody wants me to come over, I'm really hoping that uh, Michael O'Leary will keep the prices low for me. Right? <laughs> and. I can I can take us a wee bit more time on my hands, and and I'm happy enough if, if we talk about it. if there was enough people to to buy a few copies of the book when it came that would pay for the flight over. That's there's no there's no or fees. It's not a, a profitable sort of thing. But there's an interesting tale here to be had as well. And <clears throat> for those that are worried that that the night might be completely asked, Gilga, there is this book as well, and I can the two books are very similar. And I, and I can do a bilingual night if, if it's of any help to me. I'll just put my email address in here at the bottom, and if people feel that they want to contact me about that later on. Guramila Magan, Angie. Okay, Guramila. That's great. Yeah. Shall I put the speakers on Thomas? 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 Yeah, yes, uh, two things, really. I would like to comment on Owen's book, his plot. That was, we finished that book uh, towards the end of last May in our Irish book club in mm -hmm. Conor Gael here in Liverpool. So we've all got copies. <laughs> now the why. other thing I wanted to touch on was that uh, connection between the different Irish language groups. We are in contact at the moment with the London uh, the London Conlogia, Manchester Irish Language Group, uh, Glasgow, and we are seeking to broaden our connections to others as well. And we're actually working to integrate our activities so that we can we can run joint activities. Uh, and that will come up, that'll be coming up in the next 12 months. Where we're just is, is at an embryo stage at the moment, but within twelve months we'll be up and running. Where we'll be having, in actual fact, we've been invited to host uh, the event here in Liverpool uh, next year. So we have a little bit of homework to do. But yes, we are in contact with one another, and uh, any other Conrad of Gaelic group who wants to join us, you're awfully welcome, because. Uh, Feed if we, we can all feed back off one another. But that's all I've got to say on that. Okay. Are there are there any other comments or questions that people have? We've got a bit more time. Sheila. Sheila O'Connor. Yeah, Sheila, do you want to unmute yourself? <laughs> 
Okay. Uh, Dee Bacarda. Uh, my question is specifically, given today and the act, where should the focus be going forward? And is there, you know, I know it's just happened today, but I mean, are, are there things we all could be doing this to the whole panel really uh, going forward? How do we capitalize on the act to make sure that, you know, funding, et cetera, you know, is made available and focused on, on, on the Irish language? It's a very good question, Sheila. Um, do the speakers want to come back on that? Yes, I, I can go first. Um, I suppose that the, the key thing for us, our line has always been and will remain that it's one thing having legislation, um, but it's a totally different thing having that legislation implemented. And one of the initial problems if you like, that we had with the Irish language legislation that was passed today was that when we were lobbying for this legislation, we were very much lobbying to remove this um, from the sort of political discourse in the North, um, given the conflict that is there and the opposition that is there to the language. However, what this legislation does is that it embeds almost every aspect of itself into the office of the first and deputy first minister. So essentially, if we had a function in the executive right now, we would be relying on support from Sinn Féin and the DUP, which we know has never happened and essentially will never happen. So the one of the positives, if you like, that have come from this bill is that the Secretary of State has given himself um, concurrent powers whereby he can step in and take any action that a, a minister would take so essentially he has the power to exercise this legislation and to, to, to make it effective and to make it worth more than the paper that it's written on. So our focus very much goes towards ensuring um, the implementation as a campaign. We are very active on social media um, and we do not underestimate any support that we receive. Something as simple as a like, a retweet, a reply. It means more than you know. Um, I have... We've produced a language rights handbook, which goes through um, every aspect of the incoming legislation. It's bilingual. I am more than happy to share the, the um, link for that. Mm -hmm. And that sort of breaks it down and tells you the strengths and the weaknesses, because I've mentioned this legislation is not perfect. It's the, the start of a very, very long road for us. Um, and we'll continue to identify any gaps and the challenge, the shortcomings to ensure that our rights are enshrined and recognized in their entirety so i'll pass on the link um for that bilingual handbook and again i'll leave my email in the chat um, i'm always open for any questions any comments um and hopefully i'll do my best to be able to answer them for you wait were you saying you don't have any um political support for the language act i thought there were was well, some political support for it sorry um so the aspects pertaining to the identity and language bill and um, for example the best practice language standards the appointment of an Irish language commissioner in order for that to go through it has to go through the the first and deputy first yeah. minister they have to um approve it if you like and one it can't be that one approves and one doesn't yeah. there has to be you know a unified voice there um and that's something that we have never had yeah. um so that's one of the problems that we have, but at least now we have a, an avenue whereby we can look towards the Secretary of State. I use the word, I never use the word British government mm -hmm. and optimistic in the same sentence. However, it's just another avenue that we can exercise. Thank you. Sheila, do you want to come back on that at all? Thank you. That's really useful, Kushla Garmil Margaret. Um, uh, do you know, it'd be great to um, kind of uh, hook up or, you know, by, by email and stuff like that. And uh, although at the moment I'm in the Sleeve Lucre, North Kerry, I'm sure. <laughs> and we're starting off a new coming here uh, as well. But, you know, it would be great to get some speakers down and stuff like that and to hook up or even hook up like this on a webinar. And have. Thank you. Cheers. Any other speakers want to come back on, on this yeah. area? Any other comments or questions from anybody else in the in the room? 
Okay, well, uh, Jerome oh yeah, Jerome, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what how to put this question, but, but um, just at the moment, um, in my own experience of, of lang our language group and learning generally, um, the thing of um, um, sort of continuous um, view forward for students in groups of, of how do you take your language forward? I know very often we have a Bunrang and a Munrang and an Adrang kind of situation, but also what kind of approach and what what books through through maybe Kishler's experience in the North uh, um, have become more favoured. Um, um, any kind of way of of um, clarifying what the way forward for, for a language uh, class and, and the individual students to see how they are going to develop and therefore maintain their commitments. We often find a, a drift out of the group each year because perhaps we're not clear enough uh, sometimes. Um, Kushla, you want to? Yes. Or any uh, other Tomas, do you want to come in first? Maybe I'm conscious I've been talking all the whole time. Tomas, would you like to come in the answer? Uh, just unmuted. Uh, for a moment. Uh, Jerome, just to give you a flavour of what we do in our Liverpool branch here. Yes. We're using Gölge, Gölge and Stro, the beginner's level and the lower intermediate book. And then for the art level, we're using uh, grammar doc and straw. So we're using that series of books. We have several other books as well. Uh, and then what we have in part <coughs> of that is we have we have lawn girls, Irish lunches, or we meet once a month uh, for lunch and uh, have a have discussions in Irish over that lunch. We have pop up grail talk events where we meet in pubs or in the Irish Centre, again with the opportunity to be Irish. And now we've started an Irish discussion group online once a month. Tonight, in fact, it's on. So that gives us a chance to sort of converse in Irish rather than just learning from a book and, and uh, going through lessons and what have you, you get, an, you get, you get a, an opportunity to actually put your Irish into practice. And again, it's, you know, it's far, we'll get bridged and not barely clear. So we're not all fully fluent, but we get by. So that, that that's a sort of a flavor of what we do in Liverpool. And I think the London Irish Centre has some informal groups as well who meet together to speak as well as the classes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's why we've developed the long girl girls and and the pop up girl talk. And now the, the discussion group uh, every every month because you get away from just the formal learning from a textbook and discussing the book as you go along. Thanks, Thomas. And Kushla, do you want to come in as well? I think Tomas sort of covered if near yeah, enough anything yeah, I was going to yeah. say there. <laughs> but yeah. I just think, you know, a, a big emphasis, as Tomas pointed out, on the social aspect of the language in any way you can, a Kirkle Cora, a Lone Gilliga, as you do. Um, just really to build confidence because, you know, you're, with yourself when you're learning Irish, one of the big things is, OK, yes, I can write it, but can I actually use it when I'm speaking to other people? And those social opportunities do prove, it, do prove transformational in building that confidence. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think unless anybody's got any other um, questions or, but quite a lot of people I recognise on this. Um, so please get in touch with Labour Irish Unity as well if you want to continue your connection with us, because I know some of you have been active on Irish issues in the past, but the ones I can see. Yeah, I just I remember I meant to say at the beginning that this this session has been recorded. Uh, I should have said that right at the beginning. So uh, so there's one or two people who couldn't make it who will hopefully find a way of 
sending it when we work out the technology for it. But I must say, I think it's been a really wonderful evening. Um, I personally feel very inspired and moved and um, just lots of energy from all four speakers and, and great feedback from people. Um, so big thank you to Kishla, Liz, um, Greg and to Moors. And um, Guramaya Gavgulea, to thank you to you all for coming tonight. Slanga foil. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Slanga Margrave. Yeah. Yeah.